Hello, and welcome to Addressing Alaskans, a program capturing community conversations in South Central Alaska. Join us on Alaska Public Media as we travel to different spots throughout our community and listen to local groups gathered to discuss what matters to Alaskans. This week, we have Going Deep, Skiing, Climbing, and Philosophy with Dr. Kevin Krein of the University of Alaska Southeast. He'll discuss the value of nature sports, their influence on Western popular culture, and the roles they play in the relationship humans have with natural environments. Dr. Krein is professor of philosophy and the director of the UAS Outdoor Studies Program. This program was recorded at the Egan Library in Juneau on September 14th as part of the UAS Evening at the Egan Lecture Series. Here's Dr. Krein. So since really the, the mid-20th century, um, alternative and nature sports have become increasingly significant as, as cultural phenomena. Uh, participation in them continues to grow every year, and every year we see more media images, films, and books that focus on or make use of uh, alternative and nature sports. So part of my, kind of what I do here is I work in, in the outdoor studies program and then I also work in philosophy of sport. And I think it's pretty, pretty clear that if we want to under, understand ourselves as um, individuals and as a culture, we really need to try to understand nature sports. And, and that's especially true for those of us who are professionally or personally involved in them. And that, um, as Aaron mentioned, uh, that, that includes me. So some of my earliest memories are um, on skis and my first job was at a ski resort. And most of my adult life I've worked or been involved in some capacity in um, skiing, guiding, instructing, and um, contemplating nature sports. Uh, availability of, of mountains and skiing has been a significant factor in pretty much every major decision in my life. And my position here at UAS, I mean, I feel really lucky to have it because um, it, allows me to, to basically pursue these, what, what could be very different aspects of my, my life. When we're talking about nature sports, really what, what they are are sports that are fundamentally about athletically interacting with aspects of the natural world. So if you think about backcountry skiing, skiers interact with snow-covered mountain slopes. In rock climbing, climbers interact with rock faces, or in surfing, humans interact with waves. And if, you know, as a philosopher, of course, I have a slightly more technical definition. Um, nature sports are those sports in which a particular natural feature or combination of natural features plays at least one of the primary roles that human competitors or partners play in traditional sports. So one interesting aspect of nature sports is that they're not essentially competitive the way most traditional sports are. So overcoming athletic challenges presented in nature sports usually depends on character traits that are similar to those that people who are competitively successful have, right? I mean, there's, they take drive and commitment and perseverance, but the structure of nature sports isn't essentially competitive. Um, sometimes nature sports athletes want to do better than other humans or be the first to accomplish a particular feat. Um, but this isn't required. It's, it's completely possible to participate in nature sports in a non-competitive way to just go skiing or snowboarding or climbing and not really try to outdo anyone else. And um, this is important, and it's, it's part of what makes nature sports a kind of alternative sport, right? They, all, they offer a different way or an alternative way of being an athlete than traditional sports do. And for a lot of people, this is... Um, very attractive, and, and this, this isn't really a new idea. Um, so the ancient Stoic philosopher Epictetus was offered advice that people should consider if they were thinking about trying to be a competitor in the Olympic Games, right? He's like, so ath if you're, as an athlete, you have to conform to rules, submit to a diet, refrain from dainties, Exercise your body, whether you choose it or not, at a, stand, at a stated hour in the heat and cold. Right? You can't drink cold water. You can't even drink wine. In a word, you must give yourself up to your master as a physician. And then, in combat, you might be thrown into a ditch. You might dislocate your arm. You might be whipped. And after all, you might lose. So anyway, you know, I don't think competitive sports are always as bad as all that. Um, but participating in them 
from elite levels to youth leagues generally means having a coach, being on a team, and even in individual sports, um, you have to go to scheduled practices, and you get pushed by coaches, teammates, competitors, and you often have to deal with injuries. Parents and coaches often think about um, traditional sports as ways of building character, of developing upstanding citizens, and this is generally through kind of a cultivation of mental toughness or loyalty and the ability to work hard. And you can see, I guess, pointing that type of thing out, you can see why people might want an alternative way to be an athlete. Um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. First, I, I just want to um, make a little bit of a side note. I think the idea that sport builds character is something that, that there's a, a fair amount of empirical evidence showing that it doesn't. Right? I have in mind, there's um, two researchers, Sharon Stoll and um, Jennifer Beller, who back in the 90s started giving um, Kohlberg-type moral development tests to incoming college athletes, right? So college athletes show up their freshman year, they get a test that basically tries to measure how sophisticated their moral thinking is. And what they found um, is that, well, in the case of most students, right, their control groups, as students progress through their university career, they become better and better at moral thinking. They think in more sophisticated ways about ethical problems. Athletes, on the other hand, go down, right? And the longer, what they found is the longer people participate, the more serious or the higher levels that they participate in sports, the kind of the, the worse they are at thinking about moral issues. So anyway, it's just worth pointing that out. And um, they've been doing research now for like 25 years in all kinds of different contexts and basically find the same thing to be true in, you know, just kind of across the board, that the more people participate in sports, the worse they are at thinking through moral problems. Um, I have a second and kind of more speculative comment here on um, sports and competitive sports. And, and that's that given how immersed we are in sports um, and how seriously we take them, either as athletes or, or as fans, um, and this is, I think, especially true since a lot of us grow up playing sports, uh, it's, it's really difficult to think that they don't influence the way we see and understand the world. And so consider how often, like I have this slide up here, consider how often we, we hear people say that politics international relations, business, or dating is a game. But if you think about what it is to be a game, um, part of what it means is that in almost every case there are winners and losers, right? That the people that you play with are your opponents. That it's generally legitimate to play to win and to do whatever it takes to win. And in many games, right, part of the game is trying to deceive your opponents or make them feel some kind of pain that will make them perform at a lower level. Um, and further, it's, it's really ambiguous if, if something's a game, whether you actually should follow the rules. I mean, in lots of sports, it's part of strategy to break the rules and risk taking a penalty to ultimately achieve victory. So um, to the extent that we understand the world and our cultural and social relations on the model of games, um, our worldview is going to be pretty limited. And the solutions we offer will be problematic in many cases, and um, we'll also overlook solutions to problems that might be clear if we thought about those problems differently. And I think one of the, the important aspects of nature sports is that they provide different models for serious play, and they promote different ways of understanding human excellence and our relationships to other humans and our relationships to the natural world. But I, I mean, I think they do more than that as well. And um, in their role as alternative sports, they provide cultural spaces in which it's possible to reflect on mainstream values and hierarchies from kind of outside of the mainstream system. And, and that's what I'm going to turn to you for, for really the most of the, most of the rest of this talk. Um, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, just after World War II, um, a new phenomenon arose in American nature sports. Within nature sports cultures, living as a, as a ski bum, as a surf bum, um, or as a climbing bum, came to be seen not only as a, a viable life choice, but as really the like, ideal way to live an authentic life. Um, and then in the, in the winters of 1947 and 1948, um, Warren Miller, who often referred to himself as the original ski bum, and his friend Ward Baker, 
shared a four by eight teardrop trailer and lived in the Sun Valley parking lot and skied every single day. So they weren't the only people who were doing this. In, in February of 1950, um, Life Magazine published a photo essay, Life Visits Some Ski Bums. And they featured photos of, of Rod and Bob Lombard, two brothers who lived in a trailer pretty much the same as the one that Miller and, ba and Baker lived in. And they also lived in the parking lot at Sun Valley. And, and various other ski bums uh, were, were photographed for the article. And then a few months later, uh, Life put out another, another photo essay called um, Life Revisits the Ski Bums and Now They're Beach Bums. And then and in 1955, Mark Powell, the climber, uh, was the first guy to, to just move to Yosemite. And um, that was, of course, the America's premier climbing spot. And in two years, he was pretty much recognized as the, the best climber in, in the valley. And um, Chuck Pratt, another climber of the era, who's you know, really well known, said, said of Powell that he showed us all that climbing can be a way of life and a basis for a philosophy. And that's, that's a new thing. People hadn't been really saying those types of things before. So as, as sport bum cultures developed, they also became the topic of both um, fictional and kind of documentary-ish works. And the first substantial representation of a nature sport bum for mainstream audience was um, the 1957 book Gidget, right, by Frederick Kohner. Um, it was a bestseller. It was huge. And in 1959, they made a film. It was a hit film. Uh, Conor ended up writing seven additional Gidget novels after that. And um, two more films were made. A film series or, or TV series was made with Sally Field later on. And um, yeah, it's usually people, when they, they talk about Gidget, see it as a kind of, as being really instrumental in turning surfing from this kind of small niche activity in California to, to a sport that, you know, basically gets blamed for overcrowding the beaches because it made surfing so popular. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Gid Gidget is an account of Conor's daughter, Kathy Conor, um, and her experiences surfing in Malibu over the summer of 1956. So the plot, she's 15 years old, or the character in the book is 15 years old, and it's really about her discovering of American surf culture, but also coming of age, struggle for acceptance with the group, and teenage romantic interests. Um, most of that is not really particularly relevant to what, what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the night, but the part that is, is that there's one guy in the book, um, the, the leader of the, the group of surfers, who goes by the name of Kahuna, um, who gets used as kind of an example and spokesperson person for the um, surf bum culture. So Kahuna was actually inspired by a guy named Terry Tubestake Tracy. Um, and he built, he, was a, he built a little shack, and he built a little shack on the beach in Malibu, just out of discarded lumber and palm fronds that were sitting around, and um, moved in, and he lived there during the summers of 1956 and 57. And as he's represented, as the character is represented in the book, he explicitly rejects social expectations of having a work and having of having a job, having a family, and instead he pursues surfing full time, and that's all that he pursues. Um, so other characters say of him. He doesn't really say much about himself in the book, but other people say things that, you know, like he never loses a surf season season on stupid things like trying to make a living or getting a job, right? And one of the other surfers explains or quotes him and his economic philosophy. And what, the Kahuna, what Kahuna says there is, the only way to get economic independence is to be independent of economics. That the more money you make, the less independent you are of it. And once you make a lot of dough, the more dependent you are than when you were broke. Okay, so the second, the second novel in the Gidget series came out in 1960, just after the first Gidget film. It's the one where she's on, she has skis, and it takes place in Sun Valley. And um, at this point, Kahuna is back. He's left after the summer of surfing, gone to Peru, spent some time surfing in Peru, and then come back. And, and 
he's living in the Sun Valley and um, has a, a small trailer. And um, what he says about skiing is he, he describes the perfect ski day, right? Get up at the crack of dawn, put on skins, climb up on unbroken snow to a mountaintop when the trees are caked a foot deep with frozen white and a plume of snow is blowing off the summit. Um, on meeting him and looking at his trailer, the, the character that represents Gidget's father in the book says, this fellow has found the solution for the abyss of modern life. Um, so I was pretty lucky, Kathy Corner, now, now Kathy Corner Zuckerman, um, still lives in California, and she, I was down there last summer, and um, she, she, I talked to her, she invited me, took me to her house, and talked about, like, you know, kind of people that, that were representing the books and things, and said that they had, again, I said Warren Miller showed up everywhere. She was like, oh, yeah, we used to go to Sun Valley all the time, and my dad knew Warren Miller because he would hire him as a ski instructor sometimes, and um, so anyway, so the, the Kahuna character in the second book is actually based on Warren Miller and the things that he would say. You're listening to Addressing Alaskans on KSKA Anchorage. Today's show is Going Deep, Skiing, Climbing, and Philosophy with Dr. Kevin Krine of the University of Alaska Southeast. We continue with Dr. Krine. From, from Gidget, there's a big shift, and the next really big film that comes out is Endless Summer. And um, it's generally considered the most successful surf film ever. It came out in 1964. And in a certain sense, Endless Summer picks up where Gidget leaves off, right? The end of Gidget, he's, um, Kahuna is headed to Peru or somewhere. He says, I'm not sure, I've got to follow the sun. Um, Endless Summer starts with some, over, with some shots of Malibu, kind of overcrowded. And then Bruce Brown, who made the film and who narrates it, says, the ultimate thing for most of us would be to have an endless summer with warm water and waves without the summer crowds of California. The only way to do this is by traveling around the world, following the summer season as it moves around the world. So in a way, right, when Kahuna has to move on at the end of summer, uh, Bruce Brown kind of gives him a script for where he might go and what he might do, right? He can travel the world um, not working and continuing as part of this global bohemian surf culture. So skiing then, of course, follows up with, with its film, that does kind of the same thing, right? The Last of the Ski Bums. Uh, Dick Barrymore directed it. Dick Barrymore and Bruce Brown actually had offices next to each other at Dana Point, and so they would, they were, um, Barrymore says that, that he was still editing his film as he um, was like, as checks were rolling in to Bruce Brown's office, but anyway. Um, yeah, and so here we get the introduction of the central character. He is living in a van when we meet him, and um, Barrymore narrates this one and says, this is Ron Funk. He's 33 years old and has never held a permanent job. His whole life has been devoted to the sport of skiing. He would rather ski than do just about anything. Barrymore goes on to explain that the ski bum's goal is to work as little as possible, ski as much as possible, and enjoy the simple pleasures of life. So the ideal of pursuing one's sport wholeheartedly without being distracted by the lure of a career um, or a family has been central to nature sports since the end of the Second World War. And it's really remained, I think, the, the dominant ideal. And what I want to do now is try to talk a little bit more about where I think this comes from, like what's it about and um, what motivated it as, as a, you know, why, why that particular period. But... Um, before doing that, I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna take another little side journey here, another side note. Um, because yeah, sport bums of course weren't the only people to have this critique of American consumerism. Given what I think are the pretty obvious parallels to um, Kahuna's Shack and Miller's trailer, uh, Thoreau's tiny house on Walden Pond is, is really, it's, it's worth also talking about some philosophical similarities. In 1845, Thoreau offered a critique. I mean, that's the year that, that Thoreau moved into his house in, in, on Walden Pond. But he offers a critique of the American economic condition. And what he wrote in, in the first chapter, in the economy chapter, is that when he looks around at his neighbors, 
in offices and shops and in the fields. He says, they appear to be doing a kind of penance of work without end. Right? We choose, he argues, to work in order to maintain or acquire wealth. The problem, he points out, is that we have to continue working in order to keep that wealth. And he thinks we miss out on the really valuable aspects of life. So, of course, he's not, he doesn't deny that we need to have food and shelter and clothing. Um, but he thinks that anything in addition to what we really, to our basic needs, is often a hindrance to our own happiness. The, the problem, he says, is that the economic system isn't designed for the good of each individual, but rather for the profit of larger entities. So, for example, he says of clothing manufacturing, right, that um, as far as I've heard and observed, the principal object is not that mankind may be well and honestly clad, but unquestionably that the corporations may be enriched. So he offers similar types of critiques um, when it comes to owning large personal, event, um, personal um, investments like houses, right? He says, our houses are such unwieldy property that we're often imprisoned rather than housed in them. So for Thoreau, the most important thing is that we remember that the true cost of the things we pay for is the amount of time and labor we have to trade for them. As he puts it, the amount of what I will call life, which is required to be exchanged for it. So what's Thoreau's response? Thoreau's response is to try to reduce his own needs so that he has to trade less and, and move to this small house in Walden. And what he says is by living that way, he can work six weeks a year as a day laborer and support himself through the whole year. And in the time that, that he refuses to trade, Thoreau pays close attention. I mean, you would get to do this if you played the video game, but he pays close attention to natural processes. He writes. He studies philosophy and literature. Um, and he also pursues active and adventurous nature type experiences, right? As he says, we need the tonic of wildness. So, okay. I mean, I think you can probably see some parallels there. But I, I think that there's also plenty of the 20th century situation that, that really influences what's happening with sport bum culture. I don't think it's an accident that in 1958, we see both Gidget and On the Road um, on the New York Times bestseller list together. Right? So Gidget edged out On the Road and was number eight, while Kerouac's was number nine. Um, it was a time, I think, when people were interested in alternative lifestyles, or at least in, in reading about them and thinking about them. Uh, one of the things that we find is that the, the idea of freedom is really central to popular discourse surrounding nature sports. And that was true in the 50s as well as it is now. Um, in commenting on the area, Warren Miller says, you know, a lot of people hit the road then. It was almost a badge of honor not to be locked into the nine to five. The words freedom and ski bumps are inextricably intertwined. All right, so in, in one sense, post-war post America was, was very free. Right? The fact that somebody could adopt a life of a, of a beat poet or of a sport bum is, is evidence of that, right? You could just do that and nobody would actually stop you. But there's also this claim that there wasn't a lot of freedom. And I think what, the way to understand that um, is that there's a pretty narrow breadth of options that were considered normal. So if one were to remain in, in mainstream culture, one's options were pretty limited. And stepping outside of those roles entailed a fairly significant rejection of cultural expectations. In part, I think this is the result of the scale of events that occurred during the first half of the 20th century. The, the two world wars required that as many people as possible work together toward the same goal. Right? This required that organization, regimentation, and little tolerance for anything that stepped outside of what was expected. This time period also saw an industrialized American economy that was growing, and there was more and more of a movement toward corporatization and, and big business. And this required, again, that the individual do his or her part in working toward the success of the whole. And in these kind of large systems, any particular position can be filled by any number of people. So there's also this sense that one's value as an individual um, is going away or getting lost. And finally, I mean, I think it's, it's important to remember that the, the Cold War, War and the threat of communism really led to a suspicion of anybody who 
wasn't working toward the success of the American economy and way of life. Um, some of these expectations were tied to career and others were tied to family role, um, that men would father children and provide for a family and that women would support their husbands and take care of the home. And there was also this idea that if you were healthy, that that would be absolutely fulfilling and, and that would make you happy. Um, during the war, it seems like there was this expectation that once it was over, once the ideology of, of freedom and democracy was firmly established, um, the sacrifices that were being made would bring about or perhaps allow the return to a social order in which everyone would feel secure and content. But once the war ended, it was really a lot less clear that um, everyone would be happy in this system. Um, literature, right, if you look at like Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, or Sloan Wilson's Man in the Gray Flannel Suit really reflect that kind of anxiety about whether or not um, people, whether or not doing, doing the right thing or following the expected course would actually lead to fulfillment and happiness. As well in, in, in Europe, and I mean, in Europe I think a little bit earlier, but by this time period, existential ideas were really making their way to America and becoming part of popular culture. So there was um, a fear that, um, there would be no actual kind of meaningful grounding of any type of life path. And, and I think this, this comes out in the literature of the period as well. So um, Krista Comer, who, who wrote this book, Surfer Girls in the New World Order, I think is, is, there's a copy here in the library if anybody wants to read it, it's excellent. But what she says about Endless Summer, is like the search for the Endless Summer went hand in hand with a search to live a non-consumerist and post-national everyday life. The collective dream invented in the Endless Summer was as much about American domestic dissatisfaction as it was about the world. On the larger canvas of the world, that discontent finally had some chance of resolution. So, you know, choosing to live as a sport bum with few ob ob obligations and a stress on one's individual preferences provided a fairly straightforward life that one could step into if one chose. It was a lifestyle that provided an opportunity to live simply and deliberately while providing rewarding goals. The pursuit of elegance and grace in nature sport involves the continual refinement of bodily knowledge, the continual study of natural features, and intimate reactions with those features. So, you know, Thoreau, Thoreau claimed that what we really want is not something to do, or not something to do with, as in having stuff, but something to do, or rather something to be. And nature sports lifestyles I think give one both something to do and something to be. This is Addressing Alaskans on KSKA Anchorage. Today's show is Going Deep, Skiing, Climbing, and Philosophy with Dr. Kevin Krine of the University of Alaska Southeast. He's discussing the value of nature sports, their influence on Western popular culture, and the roles they play in the relationship humans have with natural environments. Dr. Krein is a professor of philosophy and the director of the UAS Outdoor Studies Program. This program was recorded at the Egan Library in Juneau on September 14th as part of the UAS Evening at the Egan Lecture Series. We pick back up with Dr. Krein. So before wrapping up, I, I want to kind of offer a little bit of a reality check. Um, I think this is particularly important since taking part in the sport bum lifestyle remains something that, that's um, kind of an ideal in, in nature sports cultures. But it's part of both Thoreau's narrative and that of the sport bum that one can drop out of consumer capitalism. Nature sports athletes often think of themselves as having stepped away from any responsibility for the negative environmental and social effects of mainstream culture. And many think of themselves as advocating for the environment simply by participating in their sport, or that because economic success isn't their goal, that um, they're advocating for social justice in some sense. I think if, if the lives of sport bums are understood as attempts to exist independently of consumer capitalist economies, most fail miserably, right? With a little, just a little bit of reflection, it's easy to see that um, in general, nature sports bums are actually supported by the cultures that, that they come from. So, you know, when, when Warren Miller was living in Sun Valley parking lot and making do with very little money, he'd driven on roads, in a car, with a trailer, he was at a ski resort, 
none of this is possible without a large functioning economy in which significant resources are devoted to making such leisure activities possible. Further, nature sports require equipment, and um, most of that equipment is produced, was to a large extent in the 50s as well, in this kind of global corporate structure. And we really have to remember that there's a dark side to the success of capitalist economies, right? To a significant degree, the productive success of global capitalism is based on exploitation of workers and, and the environment. In addition to, to just being part of that, the manufacture of the actual equipment that you use in most sports um, contributes to those problems, right? Nature sports manufacturers, along with all other manufacturers, take advantage of lower costs of production in areas where fair wages, right, safe working conditions, and human rights are, are largely ignored. So um, now, the question is, does that mean people shouldn't participate in nature sports or, or adopt the kind of lifestyle? And, I, and I, I don't think that that follows, right? If the arguments that any life choice that benefits from global capitalism is morally problematic, there are very few other choices that do any better, right? Including working at a university, right? We're also involved in the kind of large global corporate structure. Um, it does follow, however, that, that nature sports bums should neither naively nor arrogantly assert that they're not part of the system or that they've met their social and political obligations um, simply by refusing to pursue a more lucrative career. But I think, you know, there's a stronger kind of point to keep in mind here, and, that, and that's that it's not only that, that nature sports um, bums or nature sports athletes um, benefit, but that they actually benefit or, or rely on, on the economy, but they also benefit in ways that um, other people don't have access to. So while living as a nature sport bum doesn't often require a lot of actual cash, it does require a significant amount of cultural capital. So that Life Magazine article that I mentioned a while ago, and there's a picture from it on, on the right, um, says that the well-equipped with ski clothes and suave manners, the ski bums are able to take full advantage of Sun Valley's many fancy facilities. Right? They, can, they can pass as regular guests because they're well-dressed and come off that way. And, you know, and, and both Warren Miller and, and um, Tubestake, Tracy, seem to survive as sport bums on their charisma and on their storytelling ability as much as anything else. Um, and that's, that's actually, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed by that, and I think it's pretty cool. But we should also remember that uh, it wasn't, that wouldn't have been available to anybody who wasn't white, who wasn't fairly healthy and attractive, and wasn't able to present themselves as middle class. And the same, you know, the same is true of Thoreau, of course, right? So, you know, his self-sufficiency depended a lot on having the right types of connections. His, he lived on land that, that Emerson could provide for him, and um, he was close to the town of Concord, and he had family members that supported him. So he was, he was in a really good situation to be self-sufficient. And I guess the last thing in this list of, of problems with, I think, the, the mythology of nature sports bombs or the stories that, that we kind of tell ourselves about them is that um, it's also the case that social attitudes have granted men a lot more general freedom and mobility than women. And um, there's been an acceptance and even an encouragement for men to pursue risk and adventure. And those social expectations have left men in a much better position than women to devote themselves to nature sports. It's just true that the fact that access to nature sports and to sport bum lifestyles is dependent on race, gender, and social privilege is a problem for nature sports, com like nature sports communities. Um, it's not just that the majority of nature sports participants are white males from privileged backgrounds, but that, that's true. But also that the, the kind of overwhelming whiteness and hyper-masculinity of sports subcultures really create cultural barriers that don't allow other people to take part. And I think this is something that, that nature sports cultures really have to, to deal with. Um, and I think it's even more of an issue because freedom and inclusiveness tend to be central to the way nature sports athletes think about their own lives and their lifestyles. 
Um, but even though, you know, kind of professing this egalitarian ideal, often nature sports cultures just um, continue to uh, reproduce those hierarchies and value systems. One more thing in, in this, along these lines, and, and that's that there's a pretty problematic history that comes with nature sports, right? Mountaineering is historically tied to colonialism and imperialism, and California surfing is really tied to colonialism in Hawaii, and surf travel for the last half century or so has been attractive mainly because it's easy for Europeans and Americans to go to places with failing economies and a lot of poverty and go on, um, yeah, trips to places where people are much poorer than they are. Again, I don't think it follows from any of this that people shouldn't adopt the sports bum lifestyle. Um, and again, I think that many of the same claims about limited access along socioeconomic and racial lines can be said about university education. But I do think that it follows that um, nature sports communities have a responsibility to try to increase access um, to their sports. And ultimately, they need to make changes in um, their attitudes and the way they act toward people and really work toward having a more inclusive attitude and being more open to a general access to sports. So just to wrap up here, I think that, that you know, it's pretty clear that I think, I guess, that, that although we can't drop out of the economy or escape ethical and political obligations, we can still learn and benefit from the nature sport, or from the sport bomb ideal. Right, Thoreau's point is that individuals continue to acquire wealth and then work more and more to maintain that wealth or to even extend it. In the end, they spend all of their energy doing work and that doesn't lead to fulfillment on his view, but only more work. We're not compelled by any kind of economic system to participate in that way, but given social pressures and expectations, um, that we continue to acquire as much wealth as possible, it takes pretty conscious decisions um, and possibly radical lifestyle shifts, such as moving into a small dwelling by a pond, to avoid the kind of states of quiet desperation that Thoreau um, refers to. When Kahuna says the only way to be economically free is to be free of economics, he's not free in the sense that he's independent of a consumer economy, but he may be free in the sense that he's not compelled to continue working beyond meeting his own immediate needs. And, you know, adopting a sport bum lifestyle, I think, often feels more like dropping out than, than actually dropping out. Because what, what's going on is that people are attempting to um, reject deeply ingrained values and ways of thinking. So the point of doing so isn't, isn't to completely remove oneself from the economy in the sense that one will reject all of its benefits, uh, but to limit the aspects of participation that prevent one from living the most fulfilling life possible. I'll wrap up there. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you, Kevin. That got um, a lot of us I think, my, speaking for myself anyway, thinking about, I have a lot of questions. And what it brings up is I think what you mentioned towards the end is, is access. So I think the reason that a lot of people in this room engage in pursuits like this is that we have experiences that are the best of our lives. And often we're by ourselves and you have that connection with the natural environment and it's something that you'll never forget. It's something that also only a certain subset of people usually have access to. But from, I think I've heard that there are some um, like surf camps that, you know, bring in, uh, say, um, kids from a, a low income neighborhood and, and, and get them all learning how to surf. And I know that at one point, and maybe it's still happening, Eagle Crest was supplying ski passes to all fifth graders in the school district. The question I have is, it's, this is really all about me when you engage in this kind of thing. And 
life is short and we want to have these experiences, but to share them and to, to provide access to more people, do you have any more examples that you came across or do you have any ideas on how we can make that happen for more people? That's a great question. Uh, you know, some, some of the examples that you brought up are ones that I was actually, you know, that I would have thrown out. Like, I, I think that living in Juneau, the fact that Eagle Crest is, is made so accessible is really, is really great for, is a great thing with our community compared to skiing in other places. I think, you know, surfing probably has the most, is the most accessible in, in many parts of the world for people who live next to the ocean, right? Um, I also think, honestly, that, that places like UAS, I mean, having open admission um, universities that make it possible for students to come and, and learn and, and study and, and you know provide equipment and things like that or I mean, that that's also something that that functions well but I but I think we I think that more should be done in terms of um, youth youth programs that target people that wouldn't normally have access and and I think that's that's you know kind of a political like step or political move um, yeah you're listening to addressing Alaskans on KSKA Anchorage Today's show is Going Deep, Skiing, Climbing, and Philosophy with Dr. Kevin Krine of the University of Alaska Southeast. We continue with questions from the audience. Hi. So I had a friend who um, was a, a really good rock climber. She spent a lot of time living in her van. She was on the cover of Climbing Magazine. And one time she said something to me that struck with me, and I want to see what it stuck with me, and I want to see what you think of it. She was talking about other kids showing up at the standard climbing areas where people live, the parking lots, um, in their new fancy Mercedes Sprinter vans. And she had an old beat up van. And somehow she was denigrating them. She, she, there's something about a lack of authenticity in what they were doing, because they were trust fund babies or whatever and could afford a Mercedes Sprinter van. Um, I wonder, what do you think about that sort of attitude? <laughs> I mean, I don't know that many people who would turn down a new van if it were handed to them, right? But, but it does seem like you might respect somebody more who has clearly made more sacrifices. Or, to, I mean, I, I think that that also, I guess, this is just kind of rolling off the top of my head. But, but one one suspicion of people who show up with brand new vans is similar to the suspicion that shows up with people with brand new gear that they actually don't participate in the sport very much, but spend a lot of money to try to buy, you know, to buy that, that kind of access. And, and I think if, if there's a, a reason to, to look down on those people, and I, and I mean, that's, that's pretty harsh, and I don't think there probably really is, but, but it might be that, right, that the kind of, because part of the whole, I mean, from, from the, that 1950s beginning, there, there is this, kind of search for authenticity. And I'm not sure if that's something that actually can be achieved. I mean, authenticity is a pretty problematic notion. Um, but you, at least in terms of the way other people might think of you, you put your authenticity in question when you clearly have, have or when you kind of appear as if you can roll in and then just roll back out and and that you're not that you're pretending to live this kind of lifestyle rather than actually living it but but at the same time i mean i think there are plenty of people who probably just have a nice van and um that's okay too you were talking about as opposed to exclusivity yeah you can spit that out for me such as sun valley and what have you and aiming for inclusivity well one there's only so much backcountry and two, the more people who get involved, it denigrates whatever that chosen outdoor activity is. I know a variety of surfers, and they've actually started to fade from it because try to catch a wave. It's a, it's a madhouse in so, so many places. So the conundrum of going for the ideal, but the ideal is a self-defeating end? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think that's... And, and I actually, I mean, I, I kind of had that in mind when I was thinking about that, the section where I was saying that, that I think nature sports athletes have to rethink what they're doing. Because I, I think the current idea right now is something like 
you know, if you can control your surf spot and keep other people out, you should, right? And if you can control access to the backcountry someplace, then you should because it's better if those places are emptier. And and I and that's where I think that that um, something that might be really helpful would be better attitudes and values towards sharing. Um, Bill, I was like, Bill is here, and and he, you know, um. We've talked a lot, built Bill Guides in Japan, and it's gotten really crowded in a lot of the places that um, that that we, we go there. And um, one of the problems is and is that there's and there's there seems to be a, a big cultural difference between people who come in, ski a run, and then move on, and people instead who try to lap everything five times and ski it until there's no more no more. Um, fresh snow and then move on to the next place. And so I, I think that, that yeah, that's an issue, but I, I think it's actually something that's probably more controllable with attitude than, than numbers. And, and yeah, there are some surf spots that are really, really crowded, um, but as much of what makes them unpleasant as the crowdedness is the kind of aggressive attitudes that people have in the water, and that—that's the thing that seems to make it. So, so I guess my answer is that that I think um, nature sports athletes have to start thinking less selfishly and more um, kind of, I guess, politely or civilly about this stuff. I was wondering to what extent this is a uniquely American experience, and how much of that is related to our abundant public lands, of which most of your images are on public lands. Um, including the ocean, you know, beaches, that kind, that kind of thing, or is it not uniquely American? Do you see the same thing in Australia? You had one example from Japan. Um, have you done that kind of work to see other cultures, other other countries, and how they, what representatives they have of this kind of lifestyle and their attitudes, you know? And then that's also related just to my your point you made earlier about white privilege, uh, class, access these kinds of kind of moral underlying themes that make it so challenging to justify a lifestyle or a choice like that. Yeah, so um, I think the roots of this kind of sport bomb thinking are, are most, most scholars who talk about it and historians think that this is kind of an American thing, but it's spread across the world really, really quickly. And, and especially in places where there are mountaineering cultures. Um, that kind of thing goes goes back a long way. What what I my this is kind of more from personal experience than from, I guess, um, academic thought. But one of the things that I think is interesting about traveling and um, climbing and skiing in different places is is how there there seems to be people seem to be more committed to their sport and activity and the culture of their sport than to um, their country, right? So if I go to, um, well, I just mentioned Japan. If I go to Japan, it's pretty easy for me to connect with Japanese skiers because we we share something that we probably feel more loyalty to than than to our country. I mean, that's that's a, maybe a strong statement, but I think it's it's often true. And so they're they're kind of transnational um, ways of thinking, and it's certainly true. I mean, I've I've had this experience in. Ecuador and Argentina and places where you go and there there are other people who work as climbing climbing guides or leaders and then it's easy to connect with them and a lot of them have traveled to a lot of the same places and so there's this kind of international community that is um, kind of free flowing and easy so I think that's that's a really kind of interesting and cool thing about the way these kinds of sports have developed in in terms of of public land yeah I mean um, the the access to public land in and to, to wild places in America is 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 really nice. I mean, it's also really good in other places too. Um, when you're talking about, it, I was just I I did a a trip in Mongolia a few years ago, and um, yeah, ended up and had that same experience of connecting with um, people who were also there working who were were locals and and coming back. But yeah, the the access to land there is pretty amazing. I mean, America's we have a lot of land, but other places do too. But but I think that um, it is important. I guess on the other, the last part of that is that it's it's really important if um, we want to kind of continue these things and to continue increasing access, that we make sure that 
um, we try to keep undeveloped land as much as we possibly can. Um, I was just going to bring it back a little bit to the to the piece of our moral ethics, and you mentioned that when looking at students who are in um, sports in college, they don't necessarily grow, they decrease. And I was wondering, from your time here at UAS and elsewhere with students who are here doing outdoor studies, um, but also of, you know, you're probably um, familiar with a lot of people in town who have grown up doing things, how or if that has changed their moral compass at all. So, so I think outdoor studies actually, I mean, this would be a really interesting study to do for somebody, right? To, to look at, at moral thinking among people in outdoor programs. But what, what tends to happen in, um, in the studies that I was talking about or, or their kind of, you know, the, the researchers' um, explanation of what they think is going on is that, that the people who participate in competitive sports tend to start thinking about everything in terms of it's good if I benefit myself and my team and I win, and it's bad if I do something to hurt my team it's also good if I hurt the other team. And, and, and so, so levels of um, empathy and sympathy seem to go down, right? Because I mean, if, if, what you're, if what your success is based on is outdoing somebody else, you can't really feel that, you know, that sorry for them a lot of the time. So I, I, I hope, um, and again, I mean, this would be an interesting empirical kind of question, but, but I, I hope that the type of interaction that um, students have in more outdoor programming based things would help them be, would help them be better people. And, and things that might help that would be, I spend a lot of time in really close quarters with very different people. So, you know, students end up sharing tents for a week or two weeks at a time. And you have to be polite and and be understanding that other people are going to be different and have, you know, maybe things that annoy you, but you should still be nice to them because they're the only people there. Um, and so I, I would hope that you develop habits. I at the same time, on, on the other side of that, it it certainly isn't the case that you look around and see, um, you know, if you look at people who are serious nature sports athletes. A lot of them are jerks, right? A lot of them are, are really self-centered. A lot of them are really, and 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 maybe that has to do with things like just focus and goal-orientedness. But I but I also think that's something that that isn't ideal in that whole lifestyle. That that's the kind of thing that that um, maybe one reason that people should be more reflective about kind of how they go about the activities they do. In general, um, seems like um, your nature sports and. Uh, probably a whole lot of other things, including music and whatnot, it all contributes to the quality of life, right? The community's quality of life. And, and in our community, and probably most communities, there's always this discussion as to what's appropriate um, investment of public monies towards these kinds of activities, be it nature sports, in our case, you know, uh, gravity sports, Eagle Crest, uh, trails, mountain biking areas, all kinds of options that we have, including, um, um, I'd say, uh, like a, a new jack, a new uh, center where we can listen to music or play music. I'm just saying, they're all kind of wrapped in together, right? Yes. So any sales pitches on your end for what we might talk with others about justification for spending on uh, these quality of life activities? Well, so, so, I mean, I think you just gave a really good one, but, but it does seem like one of the interesting distinctions that comes up a lot in, in the kind of, in, in the philosophical work that I do is, this, is a distinction between things that are thought of as work and things that are thought of as leisure. And um, there is, historically, there's been this, this kind of shift, right? If you think back to um, the ancient Greeks, right? Aristotle, for example, was, you know, this... Um, War should be done for the sake of peace, and work should be done for the sake of leisure. Leisure was what actually gave your value, your life value, right? That's where you could do philosophy, poetry, and things like business and war are things that are you know that you do for the sake of something else, right? They're not valuable in their own sake, and and this kind of you know dominated thinking for a long time. But often um, scholars 
claim that it's it's really an um kind of a Calvinist sh shift, right? When people started thinking of of basically, you know, if you have more leisure time, then you do things that lead you to sin, you know, right? Because you're like, well, if you people are going to do bad things if they're free to do them, so so the idea then is that you should work all the time. And and when you think about work now and leisure, generally people say something like, well, yeah, we have days off. You need vacation because it makes you more productive, right? Which is a really different way of thinking than like, well, we work because we want as much time off as possible. Um, and, and I think that, I mean, to come back to your question, I think that as a culture, um, we would do much better if we started to value leisure more. I mean, I, of course, I'm in an odd situation, right? Because my whole work life in every capacity is um, what most people would consider leisure, right? I, I read books, I sit around and write things, I go skiing and take other people and do that. and and, and um, one time, there, there was actually a dean here. He's not here anymore, so I'll tell you the story. But um, I was teaching, I teach a class called Sport, Leisure, and Culture um, that looks at history of, of um, history of, of sports and leisures in, well, it's, it's exactly what it says it is. But anyway, so I was leaving and I had, a, I had a textbook that I was using and some other things and that was like leisure studies. And the guy looked at me and just started laughing. He's like, you do leisure studies? They pay you to do that? Shouldn't that be what you do on vacation? And I was like, well, no, I actually think we're trying to educate people to be full human beings, and we should think about what we want to do with, with leisure. And, and anyway, but yeah, so, so I guess my, my, I'm not a very good salesman, but um, I, I think that as a culture, we would do better to value those types of leisure that lead to human excellence or valuable human experiences more than we do. And we certainly shouldn't think of them as just like, oh, yeah, you get to like take a break and listen to music so you can come back and, and then, you know, get back to work and be invigorated to put your energy into that. Okay. Thanks a lot, you guys. Thanks for listening to Addressing Alaskans on KSKA Anchorage. We just heard from Dr. Kevin Krein of the University of Alaska Southeast. He discussed the value of nature sports, their influence on Western popular culture, and the roles they play in the relationship humans have with natural environments. This was recorded at the Egan Library in Juneau on September 14th as part of the UAS Evening at the Egan Lecture Series. If you missed part of this show or would like to hear more, head to the Addressing Alaskans page at alaskapublic.org. For Alaska Public Media, I'm Ammon Swenson. Addressing Alaskans is a production of Alaska Public Media, which is solely responsible for its content. Theme music is by Patrick Lee. The views expressed are those of the hosts and participants and do not reflect KSKA or its underwriters. To let us know about an upcoming community event that you would like to hear on Addressing Alaskans, just go to our website at alaskapublic.org and click on Contact Us at the bottom of the page. Learn more about Addressing Alaskans and listen online at alaskapublic.org. Life Informed. This is Alaska Public Media.